Shri Darshak Mandali, welcome back to our second segment of the show. Um, I'm segment to Alap Kurbo all about uh, the London Assembly and after uh, Shabai Janenje housing a Birat Act crisis, among overcrowding at the Birat Shomosha, among London Assembly key responsibility as a housing Shomande Shetra Shonda Amra Alap Kurbo. Um, Andrew, we're going to talk about uh, the London Assembly mm -hmm. uh, from where you represent us, uh, at where you represent us, and um, and about the housing, I mean, you know that um, you've obviously been a leader of a council and you've been in the politics for a long time within Inner London. I don't have to tell you much about it, that how um, is, is one of the biggest. It affects people's life, families' life, children's life in education and health and everything. And moreover, the overcrowding. Um, I know you're an you're advocate in, in yes. reducing overcrowding. Mm -hmm. You also done some work around it. We'll, we'll hear about that. Wha how can the assembly eliminate um, the, um, the housing crisis, bearing in mind people don't want to move from where they are? Unfortunately, you know, the problem is, is that because for 30 years housing has been effectively ignored in London, and it's only recently with, uh, with the current mayor that we've treated it seriously, to be honest, but because of that neglect for so many years, there isn't a lot that can be done in the short term to alleviate, uh, substantially alleviate, sure. the housing crisis. But because we just haven't got the homes to sure. meet the demands of the people who want to live in London. Yeah. And, that's, and the, the people who are suffering as a result of that are the people who quite justifiably want their children to live near them, want to, if they've been brought up, say, in Tower Hamlets, for yeah. example, they might want their kids to stay in Tower Hamlets, sure. and they suddenly realise there just isn't anywhere, that their priority is not high enough in order to get any kind of council housing, sure. and that the, the cost of the, uh, the housing is so extreme to, to buy housing yeah. that there's no way they can afford to live anywhere near where they were brought up or um, near their parents where you know where, where they yeah. where they want to be near sure. so it's a real it's a real problem faced not just in in London but throughout London yeah. because we haven't built enough so the priority that we've been doing on the London Assembly uh, and the Conservatives certainly have been putting the pressure on uh, the mayor and other agencies as well, is that we've got to realise what the priority is. And the priority is to build family housing, yeah. housing for families. And people will say to you, but there are, you know, there's the, if you look at the housing waiting list, there are people on there who only want one or two bedrooms. They don't want family houses, they want one or two yeah. bedrooms. The problem and that's the determ determin determining object that yeah. how many how many homes, what kind of homes we need. Well, absolutely. And they, those people who just want one or two bedrooms, they've got to understand that their flat is probably being over-occupied mm. by a family who actually need a house. Yeah. And yet they're squeezed into the flat. So uh, what we've been saying to the Mayor, for Lo Mayor of London, and I said in a report I did about three years ago on yeah. overcrowding, is that we need to build substantially more family homes in London. Homes with gardens, three, four, five bedroom houses yeah. in order but to you, take you, the pressure off housing yeah. in London. But you say that, that um, you know, you're, you're, you're in favour of uh, larger homes with gardens, yeah. but where are you going to get the garden from, yeah. you know? And all these high rises that are happening, if you look at places like Tower Hamlets and Neum specifically, there, I think there's more mm. uh, cranes here than anywhere in the, in the country. London has had a very long history of, of um, and made a lot of mistakes in the past when we faced housing crisis in the past, after the Second World War when there yeah. were very few houses and in the 60s. An awful lot of high rise buildings were were put up in order to solve the problem of housing. It's a knee-jerk reaction, isn't it? Oh, sure. we build up and then we don't need as much land. Well, a lot of those buildings have been demolished yeah. because it's not the most appropriate place to build, build bring yeah. families up. Yeah. And people say to me, they always say to all the, all the time, they say, Andrew, how can you accommodate all the demands if you don't build up and you just build on the streets? Well, yeah. let's look in London at the, at the densest, the densest, and it's yeah. not Tower Hamlets, yeah. the densest borough in London is Kensington and Chelsea. Chelsea yeah. And there's very few to high-rise in Kensington yeah, and Chelsea. Yeah, there's not space to build either. And there's p 
plenty of plenty of predominantly housing, the housing yeah. there is houses, houses with gardens, gardens houses yeah, with gardens houses true, yeah. with gardens yeah. and those are the kind of properties that people when you ask them actually if, want what, yeah exactly yeah. if you go to the housing waiting list and yeah. many studies have produced this of where they've ex they've gone to that people waiting for housing local authority housing or any kind of waiting list and they've said to them what kind of housing do you want not what kind of housing do you expect to be offered, offered yeah. but actually what kind of housing do you want you and your family to yeah. live in with without exception they reject high-rise nobody wants to live in a high-rise curiously enough the exception to that is occasionally some elderly people quite like how right high-rises yeah. if they've got a concierge yeah. to look after yeah. but no families want to live in a high-rise mm. they want to live in a house with a front door on the street and a, and a garden, garden at the back. Yeah. And so that's it's what quality they want. of life. Yeah. It is exactly right. But I'm in terms of the high rises, I know you, you're you uh, uh, passionate about not having yeah. them. I, I think uh, they're a, a waste. They're a waste of time. They're an architect's dream. And they're, if, if the answer is a high rise, then the question was wrong. Right. It's as simple as that. But w when you see um, the inner, inner London cities, and these days they are doing all these uh, mixed-use structures where you have a bit of shops at the bottom, mm. a bit of car parking in the, in the basement, mm. and then half is like hotel, and then you have this mm. luxury flats upstairs, you know, two bed, two bath, where some, some properties, houses don't even have three bedroom, four bedroom, they don't even have two baths, but these two bedrooms have two baths. So, all these kind of properties that are coming up, uh, who are they for then? Well, they're not for Londoners, are they? I mean, they're not for... Pe so many of them are designed for investment. Um, and I remember... So what's the London Assembly doing about it? How are they going to... Well, we... we the, the job of the London Assembly is to hold the Mayor to account and to raise issues of interest to Londoners. Sure. And we certainly hold the Mayor to account. Now, I'm a Conservative member yeah. of the London Assembly. Yeah. The Mayor is a Conservative Mayor. Yeah. And you would have thought, we just agree all the time, wouldn't you? Well, actually, on this issue, we constantly put well, pressure on I do see the late night uh, debates um, you see them. Yeah, yeah. On, on the Parliament TV, and, and I do and see your questions. And we put the pressure on Boris. Uh, I mean, his record is good because yeah. the, the direction of travel is better. He's building more family houses than his predecessor. Built, how many has he built so far? Today? Well, in his first term, yeah. he built, uh, in terms of affordable properties, he built 50,000 affordable properties, which was a record in itself. Okay. In fact, he built 55,000. His okay. target was 50,000. He built 55,000. Okay. Uh, affordable properties okay. and a high proportion of those something like and I'm um, actually I, I'm gonna guess this figure okay. and if I'm wrong somebody write in I, okay. I think, but it's <laughs> around 35 to 40 percent would have been defined as three to four bedroom houses okay we've put pressure on him to increase that number and his current aim by the end of his term in 2016 was to build another to build another 55,000 okay. homes and again with a high proportion of so you reckon houses. he's going to exceed to the 55,000 and go to I 60? I, 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 I hope he will. So I within his term you can see about 100,000 approximately? That's correct and that will be the okay. highest number of affordable properties that have been built in London since the early 90s. Okay. So it's a, it's a record to be proud of and even though our political opponents will say oh you're not doing enough on housing, we're doing an awful lot more than they did. And and I think we can do better, I think we can do more, but there's other solutions to the housing problems in London when you that come we to have a, to address. When you come to, say, other, other solutions, one of the solutions way forward the government is looking at is the garden cities. Yes. Do you think that uh, the London Assembly can look into that within the greater London? And I, I know that the, uh, well, Boris is trying to get an airport. Mm. If he fails to get that, do you mm. think that housing is an option on that piece of island? Do you know, I think we need an awful lot more than just uh, building housing on that particular uh, area. Yeah. We, we're at a very interesting time at the moment because we've just recently got revised population predictions for London. Okay. And whereas beforehand we thought we'd probably over the next 10 years need about 420,000 houses built, um, it now looks like we'll probably need about 490,000 houses built. Now, it's got to the point where we can't, we've got a choice to make. Mm. We can either build up in London and make it so dense that yeah. it will become quite similar to those other cities. Yeah, that like have Manhattan and Hong Kong. Absolutely. And you won't see the sky. No, you won't see much of the <laughs> yeah. sky. Or 
we can take another decision, which is currently being debated on the land assembly, that we we go we, we aim for gar new garden cities around London. I, I, say, I don't think the Estuary Airport is dead yet. I okay. Think, I think it's a really live okay. idea, and, okay. and just because the Davis Commission has, has yeah. reported against it, that itself is a I debate think, because it yes. does bring in a lot of jobs and Absolutely. and everything. And I think there's a whole lot yeah. because if you look at one of the proposals for the we look at the proposal for the uh, estuary airport, yeah. it would have meant that we'd have suddenly got an awful lot of building development yeah. land in Heathrow, yeah. uh, which would be I a fantastic I think he, he, he at one point said that make Heathrow a, Heathrow area a, um, a, uh, a uh, what do you call a, um, a council, oh, yeah. a council, a council itself, on its own. A yes. council of its own, and then, yeah. you know, you can have another yeah. borough, I think, I think a borough I, of its own. I think yeah. if I were currently leader of Hillingdon Council, I might object to that, because <laughs> it is in Hillingdon <laughs> at the moment. Yeah. Um, but, um, uh, but no, I think the future has got to be... One of the great post-war successes, curiously enough, was the new towns and the garden cities. Yes. Uh, Letchworth, like, uh, Wellin, Milton Keynes... Milton Keynes yes. Uh, I, I know of only one that you could say wasn't as successful as it could be. Well, if you do ten, then you know, Cumbernauld, yeah. which which is not so good. Yeah. Uh, but it's more to do with the architecture of that particular yeah. city in Scotland. Um, but the garden cities have all been fantastically successful, and I think that that is the future. That is the way that we can meet the demands that people have, and they're wonderful places. Places like Milton Keynes, we used to make jokes about when I was a boy. But actually, people love living there. It is a nice and place, really and it's not, it. and it's not, um, and it's not um, cheap. It's quite expensive living there too. Yeah. You yeah. Know, and it's one of the cleanest and greenest and brightest. Uh, quite bars. easy to get to London yeah. as well. Yeah. Quite easy to commute in. Yeah. The schools we, are very good. Everything's I think quite we good. Need yeah. About Something ten like, more. Of yeah. That. So in that case, what about expanding the Greater London? around M25 or beyond and creating the Greater London a bit more. I mean, I mean a lot, lot of the countries back in Asia, they are expanding their cities. Yes. Like if you look at Bangladesh, Dhaka is expanding. It's expanding. funny, isn't it? When, when everybody goes... Africa, yeah. they're expanding their cities into, into suburbs. When everybody goes on about the population of cities, yeah. it's only because the population is really only defined by that arbitrary boundary, boundary that yes. you draw around the yeah. city to define where the city is. Yeah. I mean, Istanbul's got 25 million people. That's it, yeah. And yet, huge place, yeah. you know, a vast place. Yeah. And by some measures, Paris is bigger than London. By some yeah. other measures, London is bigger than Paris. So it's a, that administrative boundary doesn't build any houses, yeah. but it defines the size and scope of the city. I think there's a good argument, quite frankly, for to expand to, London. To expand London, there That'll are an awful good. lot of communities immediately around London who are using London transport, or they're commuting into London. Yeah, they're not having the benefits of being able to influence the politicians. We, yeah. we you know, they don't vote for me, so I don't care what they think. If yeah. you write a name to be, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do you know what I mean? They, they haven't got yeah. a vote in my election. Yeah. So why should I pay any attention to what they say? It's about taxation and representation. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And. And they haven't got a vote in the uh, in the London Assembly or the mayoral elections, and that's wrong. But they're also using our services, mm. and yet we can't tax them. Mm. So, uh, you know, the London Ambulance Service, for example, yeah. spends an awful lot of time looking after people who don't live in London because yeah. they commute in. Yeah. So I think there's a strong argument for extending the boundary mm. of London to the M25 at least, yeah. If not further, yeah. um, if only recognising the enormous contribution that London makes to the mm. economy of the UK. Now, the trouble is what we then get in to, uh, uh, into is an argument about where do you stop defining it? Is the entire South East? Yeah. You know, does, does, does the boundary of London go up to Cambridge or Oxford? You know, yeah. I, I, is it going to be that big or are we going to yeah. be talking about just South Essex? It's, it's an argument that we need to have yeah. because these are Even a little bit of expansion will, will help to I elevate so. some of the pressure within the inner city. And, and it's fundamental, you know, things like democracy is important. Yeah. And if people are, effect, are being unable to make a contribution to the things that affects them, then that's a problem democratically. Yeah. If we are unable to tax people who are receiving our services, then sure. that's a problem. So we, we've got to fix it. Perhaps not this week, but at some point in the next few what, years. What do you think about um, the investment in Crossrail? I mean, um, 
assembly would be GLA would be one of the planning mm -hmm. authority giving permission for all this digging up and do you think that that will uh, it's a good cause and it will eliminate some of the pressure from the city in terms of housing and it I, I've always been a bit of a rebel on cross Crossroad, I say. Okay. I, I, and I'm quite alone, and I recognise I'm quite <laughs> alone. I sometimes wonder what, what the value of, of radial investment is in London. Sure. Uh, so park that to the side. Let's talk real politics from sure. my own particular. Yeah. The thing that Crossroad will do is be able to make uh, commuting into London so much easier, not just into London, but through London. Love, it, yeah. it can regenerate areas on... On, on its route. Um, there's an enormous demand to get into London. London is the engine of the British economy yeah. and unless you unless London is able to thrive the rest of the economy may suffer. However it's not cheap. Crossrail itself was 16 billion pounds. Crossrail 2 is going to be of a similar figure. Yeah. Um, the, you know, the Chelsea Hackney line is going to be of a similar figure. I think um, there's a point at which we've got to say to ourselves, what's enough? Mm. I think you need, need to start spending smaller amounts of money on incremental changes. But would you not say that your party is always advocating this kind of investment? I mean, back in Margaret Thatcher's time, yes. we had Canary Wharf. Yes. Through, um, and you that know, didn't end up too bad. Yeah, and it's, uh, you know, it yeah. made Tower Hamlets put on the map of the world. You know, mm. now everybody knows where Tower Hamlets is. So every remember, time you see... I remember the, when the DLR was a novelty. Exactly. So you know, every time when, when your, your party is, is either in the assembly or, or in, the, in the government seat, in the driving seat, they're always doing these kind of infrastructures. We, we, because at the end of the day... It, so in the we, long term, it is a good we believe in We believe in enterprise. And enterprise, a free enterprise. We believe that people's... Um, People should be able to thrive themselves, look after themselves, take responsibility for themselves, set up businesses, make money, look after their families. Mm. You know, often we're accused of p being the party of the rich. We're not. We're the party of the people who want to be rich. <laughs> and, but Is your businesses party given hundred thousand pound discounts for ab buying properties. Absolutely. You know? I mean, our part. Uh, you know, our party. Uh, believes in enterprise. Now occasionally enterprise needs a hand. Mm. Businesses need a hand. One of the problems that we had uh, in, in Docklands is that we had old business dying, dying industries and we needed to encourage investment, encourage businesses, create a, uh, create a, a, a place where businesses could thrive and that occasionally means major investment. It's why we've come to the fore with regard to things like the estuary airport. Mm. We realise that Britain has to thrive. It cannot thrive with just two runways yeah. at Heathrow. You have to compete or with three global. runways yeah. at Heathrow. We need to talk about somewhere where you can put in six runways. Yeah. And the only place that you can do that is out in the estuary. So we've got a big, bold thinking. Yeah. Like Canary Wharf, that was a big, bold imagining by the Conservative government at the time, pushed forward by people like Michael Heseltine in the face of opposition, could we have done it differently? I think there was if we can learn from some of the mistakes sure. that we did make over it. But generally speaking, that has been an enormous asset yeah. to London. It would have, yes. Because in, 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 in throughout the world, you can see that people are, governments are now building airports right in the middle of the ocean and, and waters and everywhere, you know. So, uh, and just, our architectures are doing it for absolutely. them. Absolutely. Well, you're <laughs> so right, Amit, and I thank you for saying that because it's our, it's British it's architects. It's done by Norman Forster exactly. and Argy than the others. It's you know, British so. ar uh, architects, architects yeah. who are going out and doing the bold things. we can't have it in, we can't, in our doorstep because we, can't we do want here. to save a bird. Yes, absolutely. You know? <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. As much as they're important, I mean, uh, I've got no... Look... The thing about migrating birds is actually they're not that fussed where they migrate to. Yeah. As long as you can provide an alternate place for yeah. them, they'll find it. They're perfectly happy. Sure. And, and it's been proved time and time again. And if it means of spending a few million to, to provide an alternate mm. home for those nesting, nesting and wading birds, I'm happy to do that because the benefits of that airport will be enormous. And we know the centre of London's moving east. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, and and it's moving towards the estuary to provide an airport way out in the east. 
all the regeneration that will take place there, it will mean jobs for the people in East London, it will mean a wealthier city, but you've got to do that big, bold investment, not just fiddle about on the margins, sure. which is what the Davies Commission is talking about. We'll add a bit of a runway to Gatwick, we'll add a bit of a runway to Stansted, or we'll amend it so the Heathrow has a little bit. It's, it's, it's shallow. Like, it's like putting a patch on the jeans. It's isn't it? absolutely <laughs> right. Big, bold thinking let me, has done us good in the past. Let me... Let me, let me ask you, uh, uh, we're going to go on a break, but let mm. me quickly ask you, because it does relate to housing, uh, Boris has brought in the London wage. Uh, London living wage. Living yeah. wage, yeah. Mm. And some of the councils has taken it. How, why is he not pushing it for all the council, local boroughs to, within London to take it? And how is he going to pursue that? Because then affordability of housing and things will pan out quite nicely. Mm. On a very 30 seconds. 30 seconds. The point, the value of the London living wage is it's not compulsory. It's not the minimum wage. Yeah. It's much better that somebody wants to pay people decent. But if you make it compulsory decent. within London... If you make it compulsory in London, then people will, will um, uh, avoid ways of paying it. I mean, you talk to London citizens, yeah. for example, who yeah. are the great people, who are the Advocates, great organisation yeah, yeah. and advocated the, uh, the London living wage, and they themselves would be concerned if it were made compulsory because you've got to have employers wanting to pay that, realising that the only way you get committed staff is to pay adequate wages and the London living wage is that. Bit by bit we're, we're, it's getting better and better and better and more and more people are paying the London living wage and I hope a lot more do. Thank you um, Andrew, we're going to go on a short break. And when we come back we're going to talk all about Scotland and we're going to find out how much of a Scottish Andrew is. I want to show you how to do it. I want to show you how to do it.